Okay, Forging the Cybermen Part 2. Where do I start? The fourth wall breaking sketch? No, that's just tacky. How about a musical number? You can't play an instrument. I could pay someone to teach me. Like when you bought a new light instead of holding the old one together using blue tack. Fine. Hello, and welcome to Forging the Cybermen Part 2. If you missed last time, this is the gist. And if you can't process that, then there will be a card... This side? This side that will take you to the video, and there'll be a link in the description. The Cybermen made their return to Doctor Who in Series 2, which was in 2006. David Tennant and Billy Piper were the TARDIS team. I refuse to call them FAM. The Metal Men made their appearance in the two-parter called Rise of the Cybermen and The Age of Steel. Before we go any further, I want to point out that these two episodes are my favourite episodes of Doctor Who of all time. Nowadays, I try not to watch it very often because I don't want to saturate it and then hate it to death because I've seen it too many times. It kind of happened that kind of way with um, Doomsday and all that kind of stuff is that for many years, I wouldn't watch it because I saw it too many times and it was just embedded into my brain. But uh, that's the end of series two. In this story, John Lumick wants to avoid death. He has a condition which is deteriorating him. So he wishes to basically take his body and outlive the body by putting it in a metal case that will mean that you can walk and live forever. Now here's the thing with uh, weird death robots, um, they don't really like them being made, so he will stop at nothing to have this thing made, including some uh, pretty questionable acts. I don't quite understand. Kill him. If you haven't realised already, he's a mad scientist. This invention is also quite sentient and has plans on enslaving all of humanity. However, this isn't our world. The TARDIS has fallen through the void and has appeared in a parallel universe where everything is the same, yet there are a few differences. Anyway, let's talk about the design of the new Cybermen. Bearing in mind that these things are not from our timeline, they're from a different universe, they have a lot of characteristics that Cybermen in Classic Who had had. Because this focuses a lot more on the aspect of them converting humans and less of them being an alien race because within this they're kind of man-made almost. I wanted to see whether there were like physical like designs like for suits and stuff um, so I googled the anatomy of the Cybermen. Um, but I didn't really get what I wanted from that. And so I turned to an old book that I had. This book. On this badly designed page, you can see that here, even though you can hardly see the Cybermen on this black background, that is used for cooling pipes. The sort of rubbery bits that go between the waist and the legs, for example, are cooling tubes. Cooling tubes, that was weird. <laughs> Practically, it's for the use of movement, so that the costume designers and those people within the Cyberman suits can easily just sort of clip bits on to them onto a sort of rubbery suit. With these Cybermen, there are footage of them literally clipping on the shoulders and stuff like that underneath the suit and connects to the kind of the, the rubbery bit. So a lot has changed since those Mondasian Cybermen when they had uncomfortable costumes and a lot of trial and error and eyes that were quite visible and would move around and things like that. I don't really want to cover old ground but a lot of the expressions and stuff like that are very similar to ones that we've seen in Earthshock which we talked about last time. This one has more of a neutral expression, a kind of cold dead but taken to another level. Voices are improved and sound less like just a bloke. I really like how when they march they make a lot of noise like stomping noises. I enjoy that because I think that it relates back to them being heavy and mechanical. They also have a kind of fear factor to the idea that you can hear them coming before they appear behind you. I mean maybe the Cybermen do need a stealth Cyberman at some point but I think that they don't need to because they're going to catch you at some point because they don't tire. So they're just going to walk, follow you, 
and eventually they'll get you. And calling back to the whole parallel universe thing, this has never occurred to me before, but these Cybermen are the Cybermen from a different universe. Therefore, there are kind of two types of Cybermen in this world. There are the John Lumic ones, and there are the actual aliens Telos ones, because these ones aren't on Tel Telos because they are Earth originated. But in later ones, such as the Doctor Falls, which we'll be talking about later, they don't have the logo of John Lumic. So does that mean that those alien Telos ones and Mondas ones and all that, they evolved and they evolved to the design of the John Lumic ones? Or am I just overthinking Cybermen? probably the case but something about these Cybermen is that they feel a lot more scary they're a lot more mechanical they are have a bigger presence and maybe it's because they're the Cybermen I grew up with and I've always known first anyway but nothing's truly truly scary until it's chrome. This story is a full-blown invasion. We are talking about hundreds, if not thousands of people being converted into the Cybermen army, which is growing bigger by the second. The Metal Men patrol the streets while humanity is being hypnotized and walking into their deaths by the new brand of AirPods. A small rebel group, both ill-equipped and highly outnumbered, are the only ones that can stop the continuous conversion. What a horrific plot. Conversion always scared me the most because the idea of being enslaved and imprisoned in a metal case, forced to obey commands without really knowing who you are anymore, although there have been cases when people have, it proves that the Cybermen are a terrifying force to be reckoned with. I could honestly talk about this episode all day, but I won't. Honestly, I love this thing so much every time I watch it. It's not particularly complicated, but throughout the entire thing, the stakes are very high and the odds are very much against them. The Cybermen made another attempt of invasion in the Series 2 finale. They are back with their old tricks, converting torchwood workers and spreading themselves all over the world in order to convert everyone. If you want a horrific take on conversion, then watch the Torchwood episode Cyberwoman. As it is directed for older viewers, it doesn't have the limitations that Doctor Who does when it comes to showing graphic horror. Both stories that I've talked about within Series 2 have both featured conversion. Only a few classic stories have really delved into this idea. And I think that it's such an important part of the Cybermen, how could you not include it? It was possibly due to tighter restrictions on what could be shown on TV back then. At one point in The Deadly Assassin, they did not like that Tom Baker's doctor is basically drowned at the end of an episode and that was like that got complaints from I've forgotten her name uh, the woman that hated Doctor Who because she thought it was too violent for a kids show and she couldn't work out the middle ground between family show kids show and adult show so she just thought it was a kids show so therefore always went for kids show so if you saw something that was slightly like violent it'd be like nope ban it Basically, she's Twitter before Twitter existed. One thing is clear, that Cyberwoman costume is the worst costume in existence. As Yasmin says, and I quote, Nah, it was shit, the design was horrific, and just made it unnecessarily sexual. That was all in caps, by the way. And like I just did, talking about Torchwood, the Cybermen are sidelined in the second episode of Doomsday. After the Daleks are revealed, really, they have no purpose. They're there and they're fighting, but um, they're not really winning or even staying remotely alive compared to the Daleks. And at one point, a Cyberman's holding a gun, like you have a gun built into your hand. The Cybermen were really done dirty here because they've gone and they've put the Daleks and the Cybermen together. And doing that, you've established, or you've been forced to establish, who the greater villain is. Because one side has to be better than the other or more dominant. You know, because it's a story, they can't work together. It's a three-sided battle. And yet we do not see one Cyberman take out a Dalek or anything like that. The Cybermen saw very little changes over the next few years. The next story takes place three real-time years after the previous story, Doomsday. And it is a Christmas special. The next Doctor, which is the episode's name, features the Cyber Shades as its variation on the Cybermen. There's very little that can be said about these things, to be honest. They're kind of like cyber dogs, but I don't know why Cybermen would need cyber dogs, because 
dog is a man's best friend, perhaps? I once went to a convention, not a big one, a very small one where I live. And there, there was a cyber shade that would basically walk around a bit. Well, not walk, more like crawl. But he would crawl around and kind of scare people when they walked into the door and stuff like that. And it was absolutely terrifying in real life. There was also a Cyberman from Earthshock that would literally chase people around the whole venue, um, which was really, really fun because, like, he'd come around the corner and then he would, like, point his gun at you and then he'd walk towards you. But actually, that was not the most terrifying thing there because I was there and I looked like this. Ah, uh, the things I would say to myself. One Cyberman made a short, broken appearance in Pandorica Opens and was later joined by the same design for part of the Alliance. In a similar fashion, they appeared at the beginning of Good Man Goes to War, leading us to our next episode, Closing Time. This makes a good opportunity to talk about the Cyberman's weakness, feelings. Due to the horror of conversion, the Cybermen have an inhibitor strapped to them in order to basically stop them feeling anything. As I mentioned before, my favourite episode features this inhibitor in a very heartbreaking scene when the Doctor and Mrs. Moore, which I think is her name, come across a Cyberman that they accidentally sort of dislodge its emotional inhibitor by frying it with an EMP and that means that they can feel again and they're going to be married in the morning. He can't see me. It's unlucky the night before. You're getting married. It's really dark, isn't it? I'm coping. I'm coping on my own. I'm coping on my own! I'm coping on my own! Hello, Craig. In closing time, a shop receives a teleport link to a broken Cyberman ship. I enjoyed that aspect because I like seeing the Cybermen on Earth and that's where they're at their best. But it's not like they're half converted. Some of them have wires sticking out of them. They're more like robots that are broken down with me broken... They're this episode also stars James Gordon again, leading to some great scenes between Smith and Smithy. The final act shows the power of love exerting from Craig when he hears his son crying. Even as a child, this felt a little bit too convenient and felt like a get out clause. I mean, they've used it before, so they use it again, but this time it was used less on a technological basis with some kind of implant and just the idea of love just broke the Cybermen. But surely everyone that's converted has love for something, whether it's your parents or whether it's your friends, you have something that you love for, so therefore you can't be converted. I'll let this one slide, but you can do better, guys. What about all the other weaknesses for the Cybermen, such as their weakness to gold? Actually, let's not go back there. Something new is needed. Something that will take the Cybermen out of their seven-year model. An upgrade. The next episode is the Nightmare in Silver. Personally, I think the Cybermen are absolutely exhausting in this episode. This is why I have dubbed it... <laughs> This one deserves its own part because the Cybermen were done dirty. Let's examine the design first. The rustic construction is gone. And within this story, they don't talk very much about the idea of conversion being a, a physical horrific process. They actually make it seem a little bit lighter. And the idea that you're just kind of grown a Cyberman. Let's use an analogy for this. So my bookcase, for example, is symmetrical and it's very perfect and it's very well measured and everything like that. My box that I made in product design a couple of years ago is not symmetrical, it's uneven. The drawers don't open properly. My set of drawers, which is goddamn awful, has faults and those faults or similar faults are important for the Cybermen because they prove that they are somehow human. The idea that they've been strapped into there a bit messily instead of being perfectly formed, gorgeous looking robots. It calls back to the body horror that I keep talking about. My product design box is the older designs. The newer design is the symmetrical, perfect bookcase. It's a bad analogy. Cybermen aren't even made of wood. Shit. The new design is perfect. 
too perfect. The blemishes are gone. I absolutely despise this because the idea of them housing humans in an enslaved, imprisoned way, every single way I've been talking about throughout this entire thing, is completely scrapped here. Oh yes, and let's not forget about their new superpowers. Including the ability to detach themselves like Crichton from Red Dwarf, super speed, and being able to upgrade themselves from patches like a computer, like a robot, are um completely frustrating to me. Do you know what they've become? They've become a worse version of the Borg. In fact, the Borg have got better than them. <laughs> it's awful representation for the Cybermen. Blame me, that is the most pathetic thing that I've ever said. Not even the writer, Neil Gaiman, likes this episode. I believe that there were some issues with who was writing it and how he didn't really want to write it and he had a different idea and then that didn't really come through and things like that. There's a lot of issues with how that was done and therefore it ended up being an absolute mess. This is one of my least favourite episodes of Doctor Who. Um, mostly because of the Cybermen, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that I should probably talk about in another video, and I will do at some point. I mean, it's not completely void of any credit. I mean, the style is not bad, etc., but I think that this episode sticks out like a sore thumb now with how the BBC have tried to distance themselves from this type of Cyberman. The superpowers, the upgrade in progress, all of that is gone as quickly as the Cyberman's next appearance. The next appearance of the Cyberman was only a year later in 2014's Series 8 finale, Dark Water and Death in Heaven. The Cyberman design is the same, but as I alluded to before, the superpowers are now gone. It seems very strange that those two episodes are chronologically next to each other in Cybermen stories, yet they're very different portrayals of the Cybermen. It's probably the biggest retcon since The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker. But this one actually works. The idea that you're downloaded into a cloud of consciousness, and then your bodies are kind of rebooted into Cybermen thanks to some powerful rain. Um, it's pretty creepy. This is a really big finale. You have the Master, played by Michelle Gomez. You have the Cybermen r rising from the dead out of um, the graves of humanity, which is just an absolutely amazing idea. You have Danny Pink and that whole thing, the good man thing, which kind of works, but kind of doesn't at the same time. To elaborate on that statement, the 12th Doctor's whole good man thing seems to come out of nowhere and doesn't feel like it's a deserved arc. I mean, for him to question whether he's a good man, he needs to do something bad. A questioning of character might fit better with the 9th Doctor or the 10th Doctor at the end of Time of Victorious. They really pulled out all of the stops with Capaldi's first series. Actually, I know you would, you would, you would, you just sucked. From the perspective of the Cybermen, they have downloaded people into a cloud, like you do with, you know, data. So you download them into a cloud, and then the idea is that when their bodies are converted, um, they will be restored to their body to be the Cybermen. It's dark, it's kind of gritty, it's kind of silly. The idea of an afterlife does differ from person to person. Personally, I think would like to think that there is something after death, whatever that might be, because the idea of it just being empty is just a more terrifying thought than anything else. Even though this episode is not perfect, I think that it definitely improves the Cybermen on such a degree that they've gone from being crappy robots that could detach heads and had superpowers and all that kind of stuff that I only mentioned a few minutes ago. They're now converting the dead into Cybermen. And not just that, but with the association of ideas linked together, they're also, or Missy as well, is also cr making death far more scary um, than it already is. People, when they say, like, we can sleep when we're dead, what if you can't? That character assassination that was Nightmare in Silver is now gone, which I'm glad to say. I think that there was a clear issue with how the Cybermen were represented within that story. Um, and I think that they kind of doubled down a bit, maybe a bit too much, because there were complaints. Don't cremate me. Don't cremate me. There is one simple me. 
horrible possibility that has never occurred to anyone throughout human history. Don't say it. The dead remain conscious. The dead are fully aware of everything that is happening to them. But they definitely doubled down in order to get a a revitalized fear for the Cybermen. I'm, I'm afraid to say because it happens many times but the Cybermen kind of get sidelined towards the end of the story. Why would the Cybermen want to be in an army with the Doctor? They're their own thing. It's almost like Moffat didn't really know what he was going to do so like he had all these elements and thought better stick them together somehow and stuck them with the whole army for the Doctor idea um, which doesn't really sit right for me because I think that the Cybermen should be their own thing. Um, and if they're not, they're not really worth having around because it, it could be replaced with any other robot race or alien race or whatever. Um, the Cybermen have a fear factor on their, their own. They don't need to be supported by the Master. Um, but obviously, that's never going to happen again. Right? I'd call it a genesis. You've met the eggs. Specifically, the genesis... Why are you doing this?